Hello and welcome to the Brutal Iron Gym Podcast, where our goal is to cut through the BS and deliver the brutal truth about topics related to health and happiness. So today's topic, we're going to talk about training, and we're going to do, discuss matching training techniques specifically to your needs. Now, I would assume that you already think you're doing that. <laughs> so what I wanted to do was give you some scenarios and get your uh, brain thinking and see if there's any way you might be able to get a deeper analysis or a little bit of a deeper understanding of exactly what results you're expecting from your training versus how you are training yourself. So I think, I think we're all aware that for most people, we are going to train to a, a level of discomfort that is very familiar. Meaning, we know if we go to the gym, we're supposed to get uncomfortable, we're supposed to train hard. So we're going to train hard. But we train to the same level of hard all the time. Therefore, we get an initial burst of results when we first start, but then things kind of plateau. And then maybe you switch to a different style of training, different program. Oh, wow, what do you know? You get another kind of boost of results for four to eight weeks, then things plateau. You switch to another program. Hey, we get that boost that we were looking for for another four to eight weeks, and then it plateaus. So overwhelmingly what happens is, especially when you're switching from program to program, is, is the new program will present new stimulus. Your body will be shocked by that a little bit, so therefore it will elicit some results. And then all of a sudden it kind of becomes normalized to that style of training, and you get less and less results. So what I want to do today is to discuss some specific scenarios and examples of kind of mistakes that people commonly make, get you thinking about why they're a mistake, and then maybe that will help you question different areas of your training. So we're going to talk about specific scenarios to help raise our awareness about general uh, kind of conditions or general things. So that way this can apply to you. So I'm going to give uh, the first example for, uh, for example, <laughs> is um, females working on increasing their bench press. Now, if you are not a female, or if you are a female and you don't really care how much you bench press, there's still something to learn from this next conversation. Okay? So still stay awake and still pay attention. <laughs> but um, often... Uh, and I'm picking on females in the sense of increasing bench press in regards to the fact that commonly uh, women are going to struggle to bench press up to their body weight. So most, co like more commonly, this is not set in stone. And, you know, if anybody wants to get grumpy about me being uh, stereotypical or, um, I can't think of the word right now, but gender, uh, being mean to ladies. How about that? <laughs> so whatever that term is. Um, I don't mean necessarily females only. But people who struggle to bench press their body weight, what ends up happening when they're in strength, okay, and there's still this stuff coming for you bodybuilders and general people out there, so we're going to have different scenarios and different um, kind of categories. But generally what's happening is, is in most programs for power lifting or strength production, and those are typically power lifters are the people who are trying to bench press more and more. So if you're a strong man, you're probably working on overhead press more than you're worried about your bench press. And if you're in general health or a bodybuilder, definitely a bodybuilder, you should not give a shit what your one max bench is in the sense of trying to chase that down, you're just going to tear your peck off. So, um, body, uh, powerlifters, they're going to often bench press a lot in their programming. So they'll come into the gym, they'll warm up, do whatever they got to do, they'll get into their bench pressing work, they'll do the volume of bench pressing, then sometimes some programs will have you do a variation of bench pressing from there. And often that variation requires or causes you to use even less weight than what your regular competition bench would. So the reason why this is an issue is... In the world of strength, uh, how we get better at strength is improving one or more of three areas. We can either get technically better at a lift, so therefore we're able to show more of our power, more of our strength, because we're more efficient in the manner in which we're doing the lift. So technique improvement can help you display more strength. Therefore, your PR goes up, for example. Uh, you can also get mentally stronger. So you just kind of attack your workouts better, you maybe find um, less anxiety to the lift or less nervousness to one rep maxes. So there are uh, ways to program that into training. So, for example, you can have people do heavy walkout holds on squats to get used to heavy heavy weight. Um, I've had people do reverse ben benches. We've done weight releasers. Uh, there's a bunch of techniques you can do. Um, even do like a kind of, um, not like this is going to sound weird, but like a blind lift. And what I mean by that is I might have somebody... Like, we have weight on the bar, but it's in a bunch of weird increments. You know, like a, a 25, a 5, a 10, you know, then maybe another 25, then a, 
like three two and a halfs. It's just all weird numbers where they can't really count. And I know what it is as a trainer and say, hey, it's, it's around 90%. And I'll say, hey, I want you to get really serious. And I want you to do a single rate here. This is really heavy. But they don't know it's 90%. So they just look at it and go, oh, crap, this is going to be really heavy. And you can teach them to maintain good position, maintain good form, maintain calmness in the sense of making sure they don't get too nervous to mess up their form. So there is ways to get mentally stronger. And then the third one is physical strength. Okay? Now, most people, if they, can't, if they struggle to bench press their body weight, when they are doing regular bench presses, okay, competition-style bench presses, often the weight they're using is not really heavy enough to cause physical damage to the muscle tissues. So if you think of a lady, uh, sorry ladies, again, I'm going to give a guy example here, but think of a female who's, trying, who's struggling to bench press 100 pounds. That is challenging for them. I'm not saying it's not challenging. I'm not saying it's not heavy. It's the heaviest thing they've ever done in their life. So 100 pounds to that person is very heavy. But 100 pounds divided by all the muscles in their arms, divided by their chest muscles, divided by their whole upper body and their legs being braced into the lift as well, that's not a lot of muscular stress into the moving muscles. 100 pounds can only do so much to the muscles. And arguably anything, if anything. So what happens is a lot of time in their benching workouts, they'll spend a lot of time under the bar. But they're only going to improve their technical skill while under the bar. They're not improving their physical strength. So too often their programming requires on their bench volume to be a physical strength production or producer. <laughs> um, and it's not. It's just not. So they're not strong enough to do it. So if you get a male trying to bench 135, that's not heavy enough and harsh enough on the muscles that it's going to create damage. So most often when we look at muscle damage, we're thinking about a shearing force that's so heavy it's pulling and tearing at the fibers, or a volume pump source called metabolic damage where you blow the muscle up, get it pumping and burning so hard that it causes a whole bunch of systemic stress to the muscle cells, and they respond by getting uh, more robust, bigger, kind of better with their processes. So you think about it, if you're doing three reps on a bench press, that sure as hell is not high enough reps to create that muscle burning stuff. So if you're not growing through muscle burning, you would be relying only on the sheer force. Well, if you're only bench pressing 100 pounds, there's not sheer force happening. It's just not heavy enough to cause problems. Okay? Same thing as if somebody's doing a 3-pound ladder raise. Maybe 3 pounds is the best they can do. Okay? But it's not heavy enough to cause physical stress and damage to the muscle. So they're probably better off doing an overhead press machine where they can get more weight load into the muscle and therefore create more uh, physical stress to get more physical adaptation. So, often when um, somebody who's weaker in the bench press, where they struggle to bench press their own body weight, you need to incorporate more techniques that create muscular damage. So, if you are somebody who's struggling to bench press your body weight, or you're relatively weak in bench press, and you're like, man, I'm benching all the damn time, and my progress is really slow. So maybe I've only gained, you know, 20, 30 pounds on my bench in the last year. Or it's been forever since I gained anything on my bench. Well, probably what's happening is you're not getting enough physical damage out of your workouts. And you're probably overdoing the technical aspect. So you don't need 12, 14, you know, 16 sets of bench press for technique work. Okay, that's probably getting overkill. You can probably take that, that some of that secondary work and create things that use things that cause more physical damage. So, for example, after somebody does, like, whatever their base... Um, uh, bench part of their program is, they could then, for example, use reverse bands on their bench press, where they band the bar from the top of a, a squat rack, for example. That's going to force heavier weight load into their muscles and create more physical damage. You can also do weight releasers, where you hang uh, weights off the side of the bar. Now, if you're not sure what those are, just Google it and search it. But it's basically a metal thing that holds some plates and wait for you. You hang it on the ends of the bar, and it hangs, like, say, two or three feet down from the bar. And as you lower the bar down towards your chest, right before the bar touches your chest, those weight releasers will hit, touch the ground and fall off of the bar. So if I can only bench press 100 pounds, I might have 80 pounds on the bar, but 120 pounds in total, because I'll have 40 pounds on the weight releasers. So I'll be lowering 120 pounds, which is definitely going to cause some more physical damage than I'm used to, because it's heavier than I can normally do. But right before it touches my chest, 40 pounds falls off, and then I can press the 80 pounds back up with relative ease. So weight releases are a really good way for you to feel heavier weight, which will cause more muscle damage. Then you think of different type of uh, accessory exercises, other than like bench style things, is dips are a great way to do that. 
So you can do ne like dip negatives or dip uh, weighted dips if you can strong enough to do your own body weight dips. So if you don't know what a dip is, um, go ahead and look that up on YouTube or something. But what you can do is you can jump to the top of the movement and then slowly lower yourself through the range of motion, letting the body weight or even weighted on top of your own body weight, let that pull and tear at your chest and tricep muscles. And that will create the physical damage you need to get physical strength. Another one is doing dumbbell press negatives where like you'll maybe have somebody uh, spotter help you. They'll hold your wrists and you'll say like maybe you have a weight that you normally can only do for six, but they're going to help you do 10 reps. You're going to lower it down on your own. They're going to hold on your wrist for guidance, but they're not trying to hold any of the weight. You're lowering the dumbbells down on your own. When you get to the bottom, you're going to try with all your might to press. They're going to give you a little bit of help, get you back up to the top. Then they kind of reduce their help and you lower down again, really heavy. So it's almost like having weight releasers, but you're using your partner to kind of assist. So those are just real quick examples, but they give you the idea of ways in which you can create muscular stress, which will then cause the physical growth and strength. So people who struggle to bench press their own body weight, if you're doing bench, 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 you're not matching the right technique for your need. Your need is to get physically stronger. So you need to do things that cause physical shearing, tearing of the muscles. That might mean you have to bench less. You definitely need to pay attention to your technique, but you don't need to overdo your technique. And actually, technique probably isn't even the highest priority. You just need to physically get stronger first, and then refine technique as you get stronger. Okay? So that's one example. We have another example of bodybuilders. So if they're wanting to add size to a lagging body part, so they need to ask themselves, am I actually tracking what I'm doing? Am I going into the gym and just doing something different all the time? So, like, oh, last time I did flat bench, this time I'll do incline bench. You know, last time I did, you know, incline, this time I'll do decline. Last time I did, you know, barbell, this time I'll do dumbbell. Well, if you're not tracking if any of that is increasing over time, what's happening is you're getting to that same level of uncomfortable every time you train. That might be really uncomfortable. You might be very good at pushing yourself. But you're pushing yourself to the same depth every time. So you need to track and see, am I improving on my performance? So when I do, like, dumbbell press again, let's say you're doing 15-degree incline dumbbell press, and last time you moved, say, 4,000 pounds of volume, which is the weight you use times the reps times the sets. This time you have to move more than 4,000 pounds of volume. If you do not move more than 4,000 pounds, you will not get bigger. Okay? You need to track what you're doing so you can force yourself to do more over time. So if you're not tracking volume, you're not growing. Okay? Or if you are growing, it's by shit luck, and, that, and that'll bottom out soon. Okay? Now, you also have to ask yourself, are you doing a mix of compound movements and isolation movements? So oftentimes, people who say, oh, man, I just can't get my chest to grow, all they're freaking doing all the time is dumbbell presses and barbell presses, and their front delts and triceps are taking over. That means that they need to incorporate more chest flies, either with dumbbells or machines or cables. They need to find more isolative things where it's chest only. So if you have a lagging body part, you do have to do compound movements, which work that body part plus a couple other sister moves, um, uh, assisting muscles. <laughs> Nothing about your sister. Sorry, I didn't mean that. <laughs> but um, if I want my chest to grow, I do need to barbell bench. I do need to dumbbell bench. Uh, but I also need to isolate out that muscle to make sure these other muscles, like the front delt and the triceps, don't take over. Okay, you have to make sure the target muscle you want gets maximally stressed. Okay, and the other thing is you have to make sure that what you're doing actually involves your freaking muscle. So, for example, I've had a hard time in my lifetime growing my chest. And the reason why is I have very short upper arms. So my upper arm bones are rel relatively short for a six foot tall person. So that means that my triceps are in a more adv advantageous position to take over presses. So when I do dumbbell presses, barbell presses, even dips, stuff like that, my triceps really like to take over. So what I've found is I've had to do a couple different technique styles. Sometimes I'll do a high burnout in my triceps with really lightweight but just a shit ton of reps and tire them out. And then when I go do my heavy movement, my chest will have to force to more help more because my triceps are too fatigued to do it all on their own. You can also do the inverse of that where I'll do a bunch of chest flies, really wear my chest out. And then I'll go into like dumbbells or barbell stuff and do pause presses where it forces even more chest involvement. And my chest is already so tired, that way I'll get maximal chest involvement. So there's a lot of techniques you can use.
where you do pre-exhaust of your strong part, you can do pre-exhaust of the weak part. You can also just do different kind of signaling things, like there's primer movements. She might do really light single arm uh, chest flies to really get a chance to feel the inside edge of your chest, really flexing and squeezing. You might do five sets of ten reps, really quick, lightweight, but really focusing on that flex and squeeze. And then when you go to dumbbell presses, all of a sudden you can feel your chest better. So you have to make sure that if you want a lagging body part to grow, you're not just doing a bunch of heavy stuff with shit form thinking it's going to work. You have to isolate out that movement even in compound motions. So even in like a dumbbell press where my chest, front delts, and triceps are going to be involved, I might add the concept of a pause at the bottom. To where I'll come down, I'll pause, one, two, and then I'll push, but I'll make sure I push back up by flexing my chest to start the rep. Rather than bouncing the dumbbells out of the bottom and just trying to like hit the inside edge of the dumbbell off my front delt, and it's only half a range of motion and I look like a jackass, uh, you want to lower the weight, flatten out the dumbbell, stop trying to hit the front delt or your chest with the inside edge of the dumbbell in some goofy twisted thing so you only have to do half the motion. That same thing for you sumo deadlifters who just tap the outside plate to the ground and call you're doing 20 reps. Bullshit. You did like one real rep, then you did 19 half reps. So you have to make sure you use full range of motion and actually work the muscle. Okay? Your goal isn't to just move weight. Your goal is to move weight with the correct muscle. That's the only way it'll grow. So you have to let your ego go, really refine your technique, and get the actual muscle you want as the main focus. So one really good order of a, a bodybuilding type workout, so if you're looking at a specific body part, is to do what's called a primer movement, or something that lets you feel mind-muscle connection with that muscle. So it's often moderately weighted or lighter weighted, and you're just going through a good full range of motion trying to squeeze and feel those muscles fire. So like straight arm pull downs is a really good one to warm up your lats. So we also said like, um, you know, single arm fly, uh, chest fly, or even just cable crossovers under lightweight with slow tempo, where you might do a five count eccentric, five count concentric, and do that for maybe a set of 10 reps. So that'll do stuff that kind of fires off and primes the muscle you want to where you can really feel that muscle flexing and squeezing. You then want to go into a compound movement and make sure you're progressing in strength. Make sure you're progressing in the amount of weight you're using over the course of, say, four to eight weeks. Then you do a compound movement again, a different one, but you progress in volume. You progress in sets and reps, not weight. Then you finish with an isolation movement where it's only that muscle. And again, you progress in volume or you progress in uh, sets and reps or sometimes weight as well. But you just need to move more poundage per, per workout. So if you follow that structure, primer movement, compound with strength progression, then compound with volume progression, then isolation with volume progression, any body part will grow, I promise. So that's a really good structure. And um, last thing, I know we're getting a little bit longer here. I was trying to keep this to about 20, 25 minutes. But um, people who want to lose fat, okay, and you're doing a bunch of cardio bullshit. So that ain't going to help, okay. Making the, the main component of your workout being on a treadmill, a step mill, or elliptical is absolutely wasting your time. Can those things be involved? Absolutely. They're really good for warming up or cooling down. But they are not the major component of your workout. So when you're doing traditional based cardio, okay, which is treadmill, elliptical, step mill, stuff like that, uh, you are only burning calories right now. As soon as you stop doing the activity, your amount of caloric burn will basically reduce. Even if you do high intensity interval training, so HIT training or Tabata, stuff like that, you will get uh, some type of a heart rate response following your cardio session. Sometimes it might last five or 10 minutes, sometimes on research and stuff, They've shown it can last, you know, 30, 40 minutes, small little waves here and there. There's a bunch of sciencey stuff. But in general, it's pretty much done in an hour. Okay? So by the time you step off the, the cardio, no matter how awesome you did a HIIT training, you're pretty much done in an hour. Your body would have regulated and normalized. So normalized. So what you instead you want to do is focus on using weighted exercises as your cardio. So in podcast number 30, okay, it talks about muscle cardio, how to burn fat without losing muscle. That is going to be the best, best, best way for you to burn body fat without losing muscle to improve your aesthetics. So that way, not only are you going to lose weight but look good, like that's the goal. So you don't want to lose weight and look like crap because you lost just as much muscle as you did fat. You want to lose muscle, I mean, you want to lose fat without losing muscle. So podcast number 30 talks about muscle cardio. Also, podcast number 181 discusses the benefits of using muscle damage for fat loss. Okay? 
So if your goal is fat loss and you're doing that like through exercise and obviously hopefully clean eating, healthy eating, you want to listen to podcast number 30 and listen to podcast number 181 and do those. Okay, put those into practice. You will make faster results than just walking around on a treadmill or elliptical or doing step mill all the time. That will not get you as good of results as using weighted cardio. Okay? Scientific fact. It's proof. So, uh, that's the goal. Okay, so what we want to think of by giving these examples is we kind of talked about what is your need. So for somebody wanting to increase their bench press, they need to get physically stronger. So is what you're doing causing physical damage? Yeah, bench pressing a lot is hard and it's highly technical, but if it's not making your muscles super duper sore or really beating them up, it's not the best way. Okay, it's not the most effective way to create muscle damage. If you're a bodybuilder and you want to build your lagging body parts, are you actually working that body part? Are you just moving around heavy shit and moving like an idiot? Or are you isolating the movements out? Or are you pr- tracking your progressions? Do you actually know if you're improving in your performance? Or are you pushing your discomfort level each workout to a new level of discomfort? Therefore, you will build a new you. Okay? Same thing with fat loss. Quit doing all the piddly stupid crap that's easy to do. Okay? It's easy to walk on a treadmill. It really is. But it's harder to get your ass off that treadmill and go lift some weights. Okay? Now, if you're not sure if you're doing them safely, hire a trainer. Or get a friend to go with you to the gym who does have some familiarity with lifting weights. I'm not saying hurt yourself. Okay? Whatever your hindrance is or what's preventing you from getting into resistance training with weights, find the answer. Solve that thing. Okay? Whether it's getting a trainer, whether it's getting somebody to help you. Um, maybe you've had bad experience in the past. So I've had clients in the past with knee problems, and they had trainers give them freaking plyometrics and jumps. That trainer was a jackass, okay? So you sometimes have to go through a couple idiots to find somebody good. Um, So good luck with that. I know that's a bit of a bummer, sorry. But it is true. Just like, you know, there's bad plumbers and good plumbers. There's bad mechanics and good mechanics. There are bad personal trainers and good trainers, okay? So um, I do not know every trainer all across America or in our other countries that listen to this. (laughs) <laughs> so, but if you're having trouble finding a good trainer, uh, email me, and I'll give you a list of some questions that are probably good to ask. So that way you can ask them these questions, see what their responses are, and it'll help you understand if they're a good trainer or not, okay? So if you're unsure, if you're not sure how to find a good trainer, shoot me an email, brutalirongym at gmail.com. I'll give you some questions that you should probably ask that most trainers should know, okay? So, that's in a sense what we want to look at, okay? We have to ask ourselves is is what is the limiting factor of the exercise I'm doing? So whatever the limiting factor is, is the thing that's getting worked the most. So very often I have people who, um, like, uh, oh, here's a good example. I had somebody, I wanted them doing uh, Romanian deadlifts, barbell Romanian deadlifts, which is like a stiff leg deadlift in a sense. It's it's a hinge at the hips using a barbell weighted in front of you, and it works your glutes, hamstrings, and lower back. Well, they were doing it, and they, they complained that uh, the bar kept slipping out of their hands. And I said, well, well, buy straps and use those to help your grips, your grip. And they said, well, I, don't wanna, I want my grip to get stronger. And I said, okay, well, train your grip on other things. So use the straps for your heaviest sets of the RDLs, so that way you actually work your lower back glutes and hamstrings. If the first thing that dies out is your grip, the only thing you're freaking working is your grip. Okay. So if you need your grip to grow, do that on its own thing, its own time. But don't ruin or hold back on your other development because your grip isn't good enough. So train the grip separately, use the damn straps during your RDLs so you can maximize the growth of your lower back glutes and hamstrings. So you want to make sure that what you want to grow is the thing that hurts the most. So if you're doing chest presses to grow your chest and the front of your shoulders are burning, that's not good. <laughs> so you need to look at your technique. Make sure your shoulder blades are pinched together. Make sure you have a little bit of an arch. Make sure you're driving and pressurizing through your legs. So you have to make sure your form is correct. So that way the right muscle is the muscle that's being targeted. Okay? Another thing we have to ask ourselves, and especially in regards to strength training, is what am I doing with this lift? Am I working on technique or am I trying to get muscle damage? Okay? So oftentimes those won't be the same. Because most people aren't strong enough for their technical work to also count as their physical work. Now, if you can squat 800 pounds and you're doing 700, you know, for like three sets of three, yeah, that's going to tear up some stuff. (laughs) But I doubt anybody listening to this can squat 700 pounds for reps. Okay? 
So most of us, myself included, it's very rare that our technical work, our low volume technical work is going to be heavy enough to count as physical stress. So you have to make sure you're doing stuff for your technique of a lift, but also doing stuff for the muscular damage of the muscles involved in that lift. So that way it'll get stronger in physical development as well as technical development. So you want to make sure you're attacking all areas of development. So physical, mental, and technical. Okay? Whew. Okay, so take a look at, uh, take a second to look at what you're doing in your programming. Okay? Are you progressing? Do you definitively know if you're improving at the, what you're doing? If you do not know that you're how you are definitively improving, you just say, oh, I go into the gym and I try really hard. Bullshit doesn't work. Okay? Once you're past the beginner stage, that isn't going to work anymore. You've got to track stuff. You've got to know what makes you grow. Okay? So for me, for example, I know for a fact that if I improve my performance on inverse curls, my squat will go up. If I improve my performance on bent over rows, my grip goes up. And so does my positional strength of a conventional deadlift. I also know if my performance in dips goes up, my bench press will go up. So will the health and protection of my chest muscles. By having a good nice strong shoulder and tricep and a good stretched range of motion so dips help open up my tight chest and it keeps my chest healthier if I'm stronger at dips. I also know that I grow the most physical development most in four week waves where I do two weeks of pushing myself well beyond um, my recovery rate and I beat the living shit out of myself. I then take the third week to kind of do a moderate amount and then the fourth week I do very light blood flow work. So I might come in and do like one, like 40 pounds in a leg extension for sets of 100. So it's really light work. I found that I grow the best when I do extreme waves like that. Whereas other people I work with, they just need some consistent, like stepping up. The, so more consistent waves. Or micro small waves of three weeks or two weeks. Or they might need longer, like eight weeks or 12 weeks. So everybody grows in different ways. So if you're not tracking what you're doing, you will not know what makes you grow. So you have to track what you're doing, okay? So look at every single thing you do, reevaluate. Am I doing the most efficient thing possible? Is what I'm doing actually targeting what I want? Okay? So go through that. Try your best based on what we talked about in this podcast. Hopefully it helps. If you would like help with that, you can send us an email at brutalironjim at gmail.com with what you're doing in your training and what your goals are. Okay? So I will take... Uh, five minutes, gladly look that over, give you my thoughts. If you want to pay for more in-depth programming help, it would be a charge because it's going to take a hell of a lot longer to fix everybody's training programs in five minutes. But I will give you a five minutes for free, absolutely free. Just send it to me, and I'll say, hey, yeah, this actually looks pretty good. Or I'll say, hey, this does not match your goals. Um, these are the things that I would change as general ideas. If you'd like to pay me, I can change them for you, or you can work on that on your own. But at least you'll have an idea of what if what you're doing is correct. Okay? doesn't cost you a dime. Just shoot us an email at brutalironjim at gmail.com. Okay, great. So hopefully this was helpful. Okay? So if you like this information, you can find more from us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, Brutal Iron Gym. Also, if you like the podcast, please, please, please share it with family and friends so the more people we help, the happier the world will be. And if you have any questions, feedback, or suggestions, we would love, love, love to hear from you. So the podcast is for you, so we want to know what you want to learn about. Okay? Our email is brutalironjim at gmail.com. <sighs> As always... I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.